Welcome back. We are in the last session, or rather the last panel of day two of the workshop. So please settle in. This this probably is the is 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 the final culminating moment of whatever you have heard and seen of the last two days. It comes down to this. Do you trust? Do you trust in the data sets that you are going to use, that machine learning is going to use? So this panel will hopefully give us those insights and answer those tough questions. And I just want to thank up front uh, the panelists and our panel moderator, Francesco, who will uh, lead us through this discussion. So uh, Francesco, please go ahead. Sorry, you need to use the microphone for Zoom. Thank you. How we build uh, public trust and confidence in RF datasets. So uh, first, I'm going to discuss some current issues. So first of all, I will discuss what makes or what can make an RF dataset good, quote unquote good. We're going to see what that means. How can we certify RF datasets and make sure that they comply to some specified norms. The third one, how can we establish AI competitions that are based on these RF wireless datasets? Okay. Then we're gonna have some very brief presentations by these distinguished panelists, Professor Nick Lehman, uh, Professor Shi Wen Mao, Professor Maria Zelev from Sony Albany, and then we're gonna have the breakout sessions at the end. Uh, So first of all, what makes, let's try to define what makes an RF dataset good. Okay. First of all, we need to understand and try to define what makes, uh, the, defining the quality really of an RF dataset. So we can use, in my opinion, some objective parameters for RF datasets. For example, we can consider the dataset size. So the bigger the dataset, the, the better it is, all right? The second one, okay. Okay, second one could be number of classes. So the more classes I have, uh, the, the, the richer, the data set is, where should I point this to? <laughs> um, the third parameter is the number of RF scenarios, right? Did I collect this data set in my lab? Um, how many scenarios did I consider? Can I have something else? Okay. Um, the dangers of hard learning. <laughs> the next one is the complexity of the wireless devices. So, am I using MIMO? How many antennas am I using? So, uh, are my devices complex enough? To, set, to represent the network phenomena that these devices are gonna play into. Uh, the last one is the complexity of the RF scenarios themselves. Is it like a small scale scenario? Is it like a large scale scenario, like Colosseum or power platform kind of scenarios? So that can somehow uh, define, uh, these are objective, parameters that can define the quality of an RF data set. Next, please. Uh, however, these may not imply quality. All right. Next slide, please. 
So when it comes to uh, quality, um, uh, there is this person, Joseph Duran, who is one of the guru of quality. Uh, he defined quality as fitness for an intended use, right? So let's try to understand what that means. So first of all, to understand fitness for intended use, we need to understand who are the users of the data sets. Is it like the government? Is it like other researchers? Is it the FCC? So that could be one of the parameters involved in our definition of quality. What do the users want from the data set? So is it really necessary that we have so many classes or so many complex scenarios? Yes and no. In my opinion, it depends on how the data, the, the data set is gonna be used for. So if I'm analyzing a small scale, like indoor Wi-Fi scenario, maybe I won't need like that gigantic data set. I, in other scenarios, I might need a larger data set. And, what, and also we need to define what makes a data set better than another. And in my opinion, that depends also again on the context that the data set is gonna be used for. Next, please. So the, the second point is how do we certify RF data sets? So let's take a closer look. So when it comes to wireless, we have uh, many standardization uh, entities such as IEEE, 2GPP, that you all know very well. Next, please. And then we have many regulatory entities, regulate the spectrum, things like that. But next slide, please. Can we establish standards for certification? So, and who should be the entities that are involved in the process? Should it be like just academia? Should it be government? Should it be industry? If, if yes, how, why? And how do we certify that data sets are compliant? Is it like human-based? So experts sit down at a table, examine the data set, and say, okay, this data set is good. Do we define software tools that certify that? Right. And how long are they good? How long should they remain certified? Right. So that is also a key question. Then how do we create uh, rhythmic competitions? Next, please. So. Uh, ideally, we would like to have these uh, the, the sort of cago of radio frequency machine learning systems where people can compete um, and, and really try to come up with the best algorithm, the best solution for that particular problem. First question would be, how do we define the target of the, of the challenge, right? In order to make it compelling, reasonably difficult, right? Not just toy um, uh, kind of problems. How do we choose the data sets? Again, it should be related to the problem and the complexity of the challenge that we want to establish. And also we need to find appropriate sponsors for the prizes because that could incentivize participation by, by the stakeholders and so on and so forth. So this is kind of a summary of what I think are the, uh, among the most important issues that we should talk about today. So then I will switch to the panel presentations. Uh, the first uh, speaker is Professor Nick Lehman, uh, who is the director of Spectrum X, uh, an NSF Spectrum Innovation Center, and professor at Notre Dame. Uh, he received his PhD from MIT. Uh, his research interests are in wireless system design, radio spectrum access, uh, technology Standards and Intellectual Property. He's an IEEE Fellow and received many awards, including the PKs and Career Awards. So Nick, please take it away. Thank you, Francesco. <clears throat> is this coming through okay? So, uh, so I did not prepare any slides. Um, I actually uh, only have some, some high-level comments about this direction, uh, and, and largely it's, uh, informed by two activities that we've been involved in as a team at Notre Dame. So one is uh, behind the scenes, we were actually, not myself, but my colleague, Bert Hochwald, 
uh, led the effort to actually collect the data that was used for the DARPA RIFMULS program. Uh, and so I think upon reflection, you know, presumably that agency trusted us to collect the data and, and to form that program around it. Um, I think there were a couple of key ingredients there that we might want to consider for data collection and, and trust uh, based upon that. So one that was done in collaboration with uh, Crane Naval Base, uh, which was a known entity to DARPA. They, they had relationships in place. Uh, we had relationships with Crane Naval Base. Crane secured the equipment, and then the team in Notre Dame, in collaboration with members uh, from Crane, walked it around campus on a football game where there were a lot of Wi-Fi transmitters. So we got a large population in a relatively time efficient way. So I think the relationships are really key to trust, and you you know getting pull from the market was also key, right? So DARPA had a specific objective. They wanted to collect a certain set of data and make it available to, to inform this bigger program. So I think if we can find opportunities like that, it can help uh, build and, and evolve trust over time. Um, the other activity that we've been involved in, which Francesco mentioned, is the new SII Center for Spectrum Innovation Initiative Center, uh, which we called Spectrum X. And uh, as you can imagine, and, and probably you probably know, um, there, there's a lot of mistrust when it comes to the radio spectrum. And um, because there are different interests, different stakeholders in the radio spectrum, they all have different points of view. Some, some stakeholders in particular are concerned about their spectrum being taken away from them uh, because it turns out spectrum is relatively scarce and it can bring uh, significant dollars at auction. So uh, in terms of building trust in a research community, that has been a very delicate walk uh, in, in Spectrum X, and I've learned a lot in that process. And so I just wanted to share a few things that I've observed there that I think might be uh, useful for us to consider in this uh, context. So one, uh, just being upfront and transparent. You know, what are you trying to accomplish? Why? What are you going to do? What are you not going to do? Right? Being clear about your swim lane I think when it comes to fostering these conversations uh, and building trust within a, you know, the research community and the public more generally, just being very clear, as clear as you can be, number one. Number two, giving people time to absorb that clarity, right? We're gonna set up this test. We're gonna collect this data. Our intention is to use the data for this purpose. We're gonna share and archive the data on this platform for this period of time and make it accessible. Uh, giving people the time to react, ideally to respond, but to, to you know, absorb what you're planning to do and give you feedback on it and being willing to adjust your plans to accommodate those, uh, any concerns that they may have. And in many cases, they've actually got really bright, creative ideas that they bring to the table as well. So you're actually engaging them. Uh, you're, you're not trying to keep secrets from them, right? You're just, you're, you're doing your best thinking this works for, for me in Spectrum X. I, I come up with an idea, I talk it over with a few folks or somebody else comes up with an idea, but I constantly say, just put it together and blast it out to the community and give them the chance to react and chew on it and iterate and improve it. And so I think instead of working in a bunch of siloed, uh, you know, individual research groups, but focusing more on team science uh, putting the ideas out there, letting them percolate in the community, that is a way of building more shared collaborative efforts in general. And I think in particular, building trust within our own community and with the, the uh, other associated communities that might be concerned about what we're doing. Those were the main things I wanted to say at the front end. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, the next one is, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, the next one is Professor Shuen Mao. Uh, from Auburn University. Uh, his research interest includes wireless networks, uh, multimedia communications, a smart grid. Uh, his recent work has been focused on applying machine learning to address wireless networking and RF sensing problems. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for having me. It's a really, um, it has been a long time since I'm sitting in a in-person meeting and uh, uh, in a panel. So, uh, so basically, um, uh, after looking at the homework problems we got from Francesco, so I think um, 
maybe the intention was uh, is this. So can we replicate the success of ImageNet so uh, to uh, cre create some good data sets and uh, applications and big impacts in the in our community? So I, I thought about it, and also I heard a lot from the in the, in the yesterday and today in, in, in our discussions. So so these are the things. So basically, I, I think it's very hard to replicate the success of ImageNet. So, <laughs> sorry. And uh, so basically, ImageNet, it, you have a very well-defined problem. Okay, well, well it's, as uh, Manisha said, so it's very diverse technologies, different deployment uh, scenarios. You have a tree here, you have a, the door is open, the closed, and also uh, your, your, your device has two antennas, might have four, something like that, they all affect the uh, usability of a, 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 a fixed uh, uh, existing data set. So, and, uh, so uh, many like uh, as computer vision or uh, AI applications, it's like uh, they, they have access to huge amount of GPUs, they have uh, um, like uh, hundreds of billions of par parameters, huge models to crack down uh, like an open mathematical problem or some like a, a big problem, okay, a beat a human chess player. But in our case, it's like a very diverse distributed little devices, IoT devices, cell phones, and, and everybody has its own diverse needs and capabilities. So it's very hard to find a common single solution for it. And uh, also, um, I think who mentioned this, uh, uh, Dollar mentioned is how do you label wireless data? So uh, image net you can have um, hire people to look at the cat then check cat, but uh, wireless data is very different. And also um, uh, the f data format, image is like two dimensional pixels, RGB values, and uh, wireless data format we talk about is IQ samples, channel state information, and many other. Uh, different forms. When, when it comes to millimeter wave, then you get these uh, range profiles. So, and uh, also the goals are different. So, for uh, image analysis, uh, uh, accuracy, we want. I, I read a recent uh, kind of article. It says the uh, the most the recent advance. You can spend a lot of money, huge computing, huge model. Then the accuracy was improved from. Uh, if I remember correctly, 93.4 to 93.43, so <laughs> something like that. So, uh, but uh, in wireless, it's very different. So basically, we have uh, energy efficiency, we have other things, many, many, many different things to consider. And they, so in many times, they are against each other. It's not just a single goal you want to achieve. And also, um, uh, I think the uh, Im net is that people keep on coming, applying, creating new machine learning models, uh, such as this uh, residual learning model, then you can have a huge number of layers. So well, here, so far, what we have seen in, in, in the wireless area is like we, we're mostly using, applying some existing model to address some existing wireless problems. So that uh, that is a big gap here. And uh, um, I think, uh, Geoffrey said yesterday, so why uh, ImageNet was uh, successful because, uh, what, was it, what was it? So I, I just want to add two more. One is that because uh, uh, there's a successful, there are new models coming out, right? And also there's a successful commercial applications like face recognition. So at the airport, I have this uh, check service, I just look into it, then I, I'm good to go. So there are a lot of these kind of applications that, that are needed. It's not just the competition, but uh, it's the what happens bef uh, after the competition. Yeah. Uh, next, please. Um, so, uh, but uh, a lot of bad things, but uh, on the other hand, uh, because of this uh, diversity and also a lot of, uh, um, uh, yeah, then the problem is uh, very rich. So, so then we, we have a lot of things we can play with to, to, to then just with the uh, image data, right? 
in the next few slides, I will give you some examples. So one is a uh, data imputation. So here is a, a project my student, uh, uh, he, he, he did, just completed. So basically we put the RFID text on the human body as a wearable sensors. Then we use a RFID reader to read the text. Then we can, uh, uh, could you play the, the video please? Then we can capture, we can capture this uh, human mobility, this uh, skeleton in real time. So could you play this uh, video please? And uh, no, <laughs> go go back. Yeah, there, this this one is a video, embedded video. Yeah. Anyway, so so basically, but with with this problem setting, it's very challenging because y y if you look at the block over there, so we we organize this data into uh, RFID samples into three D tensor. So in every slice. Because of this uh, reading reader protocol, we can only read one tag. Okay, so basically among these uh, 36, 36 data units, we only one valid data. So it's a very sparse, very noisy data. Then we can, but we, we play a trick called tensor completion. We can estimate those missing data from this received one sample. Then eventually we can get a, a pretty good results. So it's very sparse, very noisy, but we can deal with it. Uh, next, please. And here is another example of uh, data imputation. So, so this is a uh, uh, fingerprinting, uh, local indoor localization. So we mark the ground. We we started this in uh, 2014. So we then we mark the ground, and then we do measurements at each of those dot places. Then we and uh, use this information to decide the location of a device. So what what we played the the trick is that we use this Gaussian deep Gaussian process. So we can uh, estimate uh, like the, the terrain or the radio map based on those uh, uh, measured the real samples. Okay, so we can use a very small set of uh, samples, but we can still construct a very uh, uh, radio map with high fidelity. Okay, so, uh, and because, um, uh, because the, this model is a Bayesian model, so we can, we can tell if this map is reliable, which part is more reliable than some other parts. And this information can be used to uh, better locate uh, a new device. Okay. Next, please. And uh, another trick we can play is data augmentation. So um, uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, there's a, a very uh, classical application of uh, Automatic uh, modulation classification started back in the cognitive radio days. So, so um, and a uh, very popular data set is the radio ML data set that's uh, synthesized uh, using our USRP. But uh, one issue is that it only contains 1,000 samples for each modulation and each signal noise ratio. So then we can apply a conditional gain, okay? So that can synthesize new data from these 1,000 samples, based on 1,000 samples, and they will give you the same kind of distribution, and it's a label the data, so that can be used for supervised learning training. So those two figures show the original data and synthesized data, and here this plot shows the, uh, the, the synthesized data does improve the, the uh, performance accuracy of this uh, uh, AMC. Yeah. Next, please. And. Uh, Another more uh, challenging case is uh, uh, data augmentation. We, we, we just uh, synthesize uh, RFID data, radio data. So um, the, it works like this. So basically we, we, we want to uh, do this uh, human skeleton 3D pose monitoring. Then uh, to do this, we have used um, bimodal data, a video camera, we capture the real, the labels, the real human skeleton. And this will be used to train the model to learn from RFID data. But this kind of, uh, you, you, we need to capture both video data and uh, RFID data and synchronize them. So it's, we need uh, maybe an hour, a trace of an hour duration to train. So then later on, we, we come up with this uh, uh, alpha post scan, okay. So basically we just need to use this uh, skeleton as input. Then it will synthesize RFID data, okay and uh, they look very similar, the upper one and the lower one. And uh, you, you can use this synthesized data to improve the uh, 
performance of this uh, gesture, yeah, uh, human activity recognition, yeah, yeah. okay. And uh, uh, even better, even that uh, input human skeleton out there, so that can be simulated. You just uh, give the height, uh, a long length of the arm and things like that, then uh, use mental lab to simulate some movements, then this will give you RFID data, then that can be used to train your model. Okay, yeah, next please. Um, another example is uh, we want to reduce uh, the, the dependence on data. So uh, one, uh, one uh, important problem is like uh, anomaly detection. So uh, we have an example, it's a sleep apnea detection. So some people suddenly stop breathing during sleep, then resume again. So, but this kind of data is very hard to obtain because uh, I, I did this uh, last month. So I have to go to the hospital, sleep there with all the, all the sensors wearing above my body and uh, stick to my head and sleep there for one night. And the nurses keep on monitoring you and things like that. So it's very hard to, then maybe during the night there was some like a few seconds as they, catch, they caught the, the, the problem. So, but, we can use uh, uh, this uh, autoencoder, variation of autoencoder, then we don't need uh, that kind of uh, uh, rare event anomaly data. We just train this using normal data. So when the input is uh, anomaly, then the output will be different. Then you can